And again, I'm getting lots of volume off the back wall up here, uh, or I'm, I'm not in the monitor, but I'm getting lots of, lots of noise off the back back here, and uh, which means it's probably really loud out there. <clears throat> you good, Angie? All right. So again, take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 5 in just a moment. The title of the message this morning is, And the Silence is Broken. We talked about the seeming 400 years of silence last week, how that they had no new revelation, they didn't have a prophet, there was no new prophecies. And so for 400 years, there was just silence from the last prophet to, and to the, the announcements of, of Christ. So even though, we talked about last week, even though they didn't have a, a new prophet, they didn't have new revelation, they still had the word of God. And it was speaking loudly, very loudly. So it really wasn't silent. But just for the idea of no new voice from heaven, the silence is now broken. God has been speaking through his written word for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and many were listening, like we saw last week. But now there's definitely audible word from the Lord. We start seeing a whole bunch of fun things start happening. And beginning in verse 5, we see the first announcement of, of, of the things that are leading to the Messiah. So the first announcement we see is in 5. It says, And there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of people were praying without at the time of incense. So remember, he goes in, and the job was he was offered a, the incense as a, as a prayer, and then he would come out and bless the people. He'd share the blessing of God on the people, pronounce his blessing, and, and that, would be, that would be his role. So here we have Zacharias, a man of God. His wife is a woman of God. They're faithful. They're serving. He's busy doing what God has him do. And you're going to find that God comes to call busy people, people who are already working. He doesn't call people who are sitting around going, well, when the Lord tells me what he wants me to do, then I'll go do something. God calls people who are active, calls people who are doing something. If you won't do something now, what, what tells him you will do something in the future? Now, obviously, he's God and he knows all things. But watch the pattern in the Bible. He comes to people that are working, even when the work is maybe not the brightest work in the world. Like when he came to um, Gideon to be his leader of his tiny army that was going to face, you know, 30,000 soldiers. He was busy threshing wheat. He was just doing it in a hollow where there wasn't any wind. I, you know, I just, I just wish we could have a video set from all the past, I wish God would just give us some DVDs or something so we could watch some of this. To watch somebody down in a hole, down in a, in a hollow where he's got no wind and throwing up his chaff so the wind can blow it away when there's no wind. That's got to be great to watch. That's like a sitcom. You know, he, you, know you understand why, right? Because the Philistines would come steal everything. I mean, the Midianites would come and steal everything. So he's, he's trying to thresh his wheat, but you thresh wheat, you beat all the seeds out of it, and then you throw the stalks up, and the wind blows it away, and the seeds fall back down. And it's all just coming back down on him. It's like cutting a tree limb over at Jay's a while back. We were cutting trees. Had one, I, the only way I could reach it was standing under it, basically. And so I'm cutting the limb, and, man, I'm just getting snowed on with, with you know, uh, uh, sawdust. And I'm just getting covered. Yeah, but I'm going to get it. <laughs> he calls busy people. Zacharias was faithful. He was serving the Lord. He was serving the Lord in what he was supposed to do. He was faithful to do that. He was faithful to honor God. And so he was chosen. His son to be born was chosen. And the angel comes to give him the announcement that his wife is going to conceive. So let's have a word of prayer real quick and we'll continue on. So Father, we thank you again for your word and for the blessing that you give us of reading your word and, and being together to study your word and to worship you and to learn from you. Father, let this just be a great day in you that we, that we see. Maybe it's not something that's new to us, but Father, it's refreshing to us. And we, we get excited again when we see you working in, in this day and what all you did and how you did. Father, let us take the joy that is here. Let us take the, the teaching that is here, the correction or the warnings or whatever it is you have for us today. Let us pay attention to that, but let us enjoy being in your presence and, and preaching and teaching and hearing your word. And Father, thank you for all of us being able to be together. 
be with our ones that can't be here today. We, we pray a special blessing on them. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Zacharias is busy for the Lord. But the next thing we see is that Gabriel comes with some good news. His barren wife is going to bear a son, and he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. So in verse 11, it says, And there appeared unto him. So remember, he's in the temple. He's in the temple offering incense. And an angel appears. Now, Zechariah knows the word of God, right? He's a priest. So he knows about Hezekiah going in. He knows that the angel appears to him or the angel of the Lord appears to him when he's trying to burn incense and that's not for him. And he ends up dying a leper because of the curse of God, because of his disobedience. He knows that Isaiah was then in the same year he was in the temple and an angel appeared. So you've got two times that you see the angel appear in the temple. One time it was traumatic. It, it cost a man his life. The next time it was a blessing. What's this one going to be? Don't know. All I know is I'm in the temple. I'm doing my job. And now here's an angel. So there's got to be there's got to be a certain just awe and intimidation of seeing an angel. Remember John writing the book of Revelation. As God's revealing, he takes him up and he's showing him these things. And one of the first things he sees after he's taken up is he sees this angel that's talking to him and he bows down to worship him. And the angel says, whoa, boy, I'm just a servant like you are. Don't worship me. You only worship the Lord. The angels are so profound. So he sees this angel. So, wow. And he says to him, he sees the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Yeah, I would be too. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God and shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready the people prepared to, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. I'd be a little troubled too if an angel suddenly appeared in here. That would bother me a little bit. I just got to tell you, I've never seen one now, I may have. I may have. I don't know. I had one of those weird dreams when I was a kid where this bright being came out of, my, out of the air conditioner vent in my living room. And before you get too freaky, you should listen to this. I was a little kid. I heard the, I saw this light in the hallway. I heard this noise, and I went into my living room, and there's this being that comes out of the, out of the vent, and he speaks to me. And I can't tell you to this day what he said or, or how he said or what he did. But something about him made me realize this was not this was not a God thing. And I ran back to my bedroom, and I woke up. And a few days later, I went to spend the weekend with my dad. And I was telling my dad about this dream. And he just got pale. He said, when did you have that dream? And I told him what night it was. And, and he was just, I mean, he was really pale. I said, Dad, what's the matter? He said, I had the exact same dream on the exact same night. Now, I don't know what that is or what that means. But I'm telling you, the spiritual world is real, and I don't know what that means, or if we just were just freaks of nature, we just had the same dream on the same night. It's a little too exact to have the exact same dream. So I don't know what we saw. I don't know if it was really like a vision kind of thing, because the Bible says in the last days, you know, people are going to dream dreams and have visions. I don't know. I have no message from it. It wasn't anything like that. But it was weird, and it was profound, and it was frightening. But the being I saw was unbelievably bright. Now, I'm not in the temple serving as a priest when the angel of the Lord appears. I can't imagine the troubling sensation of that because, again, one time he appeared and it was judgment. One time he appeared, it was calling Isaiah to, to serve it, to be his prophet, to be his priest and prophet. So he's, he's troubled at this. And now he tells him, hey, your wife's going to have a son. Your prayer is answered. Your wife is going to have a son. We've heard that before, haven't we? When, when Christ in, in the form of a man came to, uh, came to Abraham and said, about this time next year, your wife is going to have a son. And Sarah's laughing in the tent. Then why did she laugh? Oh, I didn't laugh. 
Now you're going to lie to the Lord? Don't you know there had to be some trepidation there? Really? My wife, you know, we're, we're kind of past this, Lori. And don't you know there's a piece of that that says, you know, I'm really too old to raise kids now. How many of you who are past the time, you're well stricken in age, and you pass the time of having children, would love to hear the news that God has blessed you and you're going to have another child? How many of you would go, woo, yay, hallelujah, I am so ready at my well stricken years to have a baby again? I'm only 59. And my granddaughter wears me out sometimes. I like my sleep, and when she screams at 3 in the morning because it's time to feed again, that startles me a little bit. I'm just saying, and I'm not well stricken yet. If my wife shows up pregnant, we in trouble. If she can't now, anyhow. So I'm going to say, so he tells you, you're going you're to have a child. So you you, you got to know that there's a piece of him that is excited because they've longed for a child all these years. And at the same time, I'm an old guy. And you're telling me I'm going to have a baby now? My wife is going to give birth? My wife is going to have a baby? <laughs> wow. And, and he's going to be he's going to be called. He's going to be, put, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from the mother's womb. So from the time of his conception, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So great. I now I got a holy rover living inside me, jumping around, doing things. I mean, this is crazy. He's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah? This, this is the prophecy? In fact, if you look at Micah uh, chapter 4, verse 5, it said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So it, look at this. He just told him. He says, and many children shall he turn to the Lord. He should go before them. He says, he, should, he won't drink any of these things. He's going to be the forerunner. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Man, this is exciting, I think. This is exciting, sort of. Oh, I'm, I, now, I'm, now I'm channeling Abraham. Abraham was, was 100 and Sarah was 90. And, and, and oh, man. I, the Bible, I don't think the Bible tells us how old. Zechariah just says he was well stricken in age. So he's an old guy. But, but then Zechariah, now think about this. He's offering incense, and the angel of the Lord appears. Power, glory, majesty comes out of nowhere. You know, TV didn't exist back then. We didn't have all of the capabilities for all the fancy effects. This was all legitimate, straight up, real happenings, right? So, Zechariah, at this point, should fall on his face and, oh, thank you for this blessing, right? <laughs> no. Verse 18, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife will stricken in years. And the angel answering said, said, said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, now, see, in, in modern English, we would say, and behold, you are dumb, and you're not going to be able to speak. So he says, behold, thou be, shalt be dumb, not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. So you got all this going on. Now the people are like, well, how long does it take to offer incense? It's never been this long before. What's, what's going on? Did something happen? Is God not accepting our, our sacrifice? Is he not accepting our worship? He's not, is he not going to bless us? And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass, as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to, to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the, in the, in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. So... She goes and she hides. Because listen, there's a lot of stir about this. He came out and he calls for a tablet and they write everything down. And, and so everybody knows what's going on. And, and so he's writing all this. And, and you know, so everybody's going to be watching now. What happens, ladies, the moment you say, I think I'm pregnant? What happens to all the people around you? Especially all the women folk. It's fun, doesn't it? Well, so, you know, so how far along do you think I have to take a test? Have you done it? So, this is an old woman who just got pregnant. And she goes and hides out for a little while. 
Because don't you know, the conversation has already started. Toya, are you pregnant yet? You know, have you, are, have you conceived? Do you, or do you think you're pregnant yet? She just hides out. But during all of this, we see the second announcement. This one's to Mary. In 20, verse 26. He said, in the sixth month, of, uh, sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel, when she uh, came into her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. Wow. He shows up. Hail Mary. Favorite of God. And she's like, what kind of salutation is this? That an angel shows up and, and is not telling me there's something I got to do or tell me there's something wrong or tell me to rebuke me or something. He just comes and says, Hail Mary, you, you're, you're wonderful. You're blessed among women. You, are, you have favor with God. He's like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to respond to this. Wow. wow. So Mary asked some questions. Only unlike Zacharias, it's not in disbelief. And she's just trying to understand how this is going to happen. Look at what she says in verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? This is why I get so tickled when people say, well, you know, uh, there, you know, can't be born of a virgin. And, you know, back then they didn't understand the science. How can this be, seeing I know not a man? And they knew where babies came from even back then. They kind of figured it out with Adam and Eve. It kind of started, that whole knowledge thing started with Adam and Eve. They kind of knew from the beginning where babies came from. And, and if you didn't have a man and a woman, you didn't get a baby. And you know the amazing thing is still true today. If you don't have a man and a woman, you don't get a baby. Now, we can do all sorts of scientific things. We can put stuff together in a test tube and plant it in somebody, and they, and they bring forth the baby. But, but you still had to have a man and a woman to get all the stuff you need to make the baby. Well, my jokes used to be, did you know if, you're, if your mother didn't have children, you probably won't either? And people used to look at me and, go, and they have to sit and think about it. You know, you can't say that anymore. Because of surrogate parenting and stuff, you can, you can have everything that you need to put it in somebody who's not your actual mother, but carries you and delivers you. So your mother didn't, have any, didn't, didn't, didn't give birth, but she still had children. And it messes up good dad jokes right there. I mean, it just totally messes them up. But trust me, they understood the science of how babies get here. And even today, two men can't have a baby. Two women can't have a baby. Now, you can do the God thing, the way God designed babies to get here, and put those in a woman, but two women can't do that. Two men can't do that. God set up a system that works, and it just doesn't work any other way. So this is scripture being fulfilled that a virgin would give birth. That's part of the miracle of the birth of Christ. She couldn't, he couldn't have a sin nature. So he couldn't have the blood of his dad, which is what the males contribute. The blood type and the gender. That's what men contribute. So he couldn't have an earthly man contribute those parts. So God had to plant that in her. This was not a sensual thing. This was not a sexual thing. This was God planting the pieces that were needed to, to, to fertilize the egg that would be born one day, Jesus Christ. Fully God, fully man. So she's asking, how can this be? Because I, I haven't known a man. And the angel answered, Senator, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, 
who is called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary gives the greatest response possible. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Several places in the scripture you find where Mary kept these things in her heart and pondered them. This was a lot to ponder. God sent his official messenger to speak to her personally, one-on-one, and told her she was highly blessed. She was blessed among women that she had found favor with God. So obviously this is a godly young woman. It is believed that she was around 14 years old. That's when, that's when they got married and started having kids. And I tell you, if we would mature our kids and grow them up like they used to do in the Bible, then that's a great time to get married. That's about when all the stuff is going on, the, all that drive, and, and you're young enough to have babies and not tear you up, and you're, and you're young enough to enjoy your grandkids and your great-grandkids, right? I don't know many 14-year-olds. I would say, yeah, go, go get married. Start having babies right now. Just go get married. But we used to mature kids. We used to grow them. We used to teach them things. And they used to be much more mature than they are today. And we can still do it, and many do. We've got some youngins in, in, our, in our midst today that are really down the road, and it's because of really good parenting. So Mary takes a trip now to go see her cousin. I think there's a couple of reasons in this, but let's look here in verse 39. It says, And Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste and into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and whence whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord shall come unto me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. So Mary is still trying to grasp this idea that God has just done this great thing and that she is going to be the bearer of the Messiah. She's going to be the mom to the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How heavy is that on a young teenage girl? How exciting is that, but how fearful is that? The responsibility, I've got to raise the Messiah. Wow, have you you ever thought about the responsibility she had to feel? And Joseph, he's got to be stepdad to the king and raise him to be a godly young man, to raise him to understand that he is not his dad, but the heavenly father is his dad. Oh, all the depth of all the stuff, if we just sit and think about it, all that's got to go on, all the things that have to take place, all the things that she's got to think and, and to ponder on and to trust God for. But I think she went to see Elizabeth for a couple of reasons. I think one, and and this is some Davidology here, okay? So just to tell you up front, this is some Davidology. I think she went for a couple of reasons. One, I think she went to to confirm the message she received. She wanted to make sure that she really did see the angel of the Lord. She wanted to find some way to confirm that his message was absolutely it. It wasn't in disbelief. She just wanted to know for sure. But I think the other one is to confirm her virginity. And I think I've shared this, probably shared it every year. If, if a man and woman got married and they went in on their wedding night to consummate their marriage, if the man believed that she was not a virgin, then they would go to the priest. And there were two things that were to be done. One, they were to take the bedclothes to show the blood. And if that was not the case, they were to go and confirm that she was or wasn't. And if he thinks something happened before their marriage, then they were to go to the priest, and the priest was to check to see if the woman was indeed unknown by a man. And you all know the way that you do that. I think if you're a young woman, and you've been told that you are carrying the seed of the Messiah, and you know what's getting ready to happen because you're going to be pregnant and you've never known your husband, you're going to want to have some signs. There's going to be some questions. Joseph has the right to take her to a priest to verify that she truly is a virgin still. If you got to go to a man that's not your husband to be confirmed that you are still pure, wouldn't you go maybe see your cousin? Go to somebody you can trust. And while it would be embarrassing to have your cousin look at you, you'd be there with your cousin Elizabeth, and her husband could perform what needed to be performed to verify. Because she was going to be challenged 
she was going to be tested. She was going to be accused of being a, 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 an ungodly woman because she's going to be very pregnant and it's going to be very obvious and people are going to assume that she's been playing the harlot. And she will be able to say, you check with the priest. He verified my purity. And also by seeing Elizabeth and all the things that happened confirmed that what she heard was really what she heard. That she got the message clearly. And she went to celebrate with her and it was confirmation for her. The babe leaps inside of, of Elizabeth because he's already full of the Holy Spirit. The baby's sleeping. She just has confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. And then Mary does what we all should do when we encounter the Lord and, and he does things in our life. She turns to praise him. Mary has met with Elizabeth. She's heard all these things. Elizabeth is, has said that you're carrying my Lord. And Mary said in verse 46, my soul does magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For he behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. He that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of the hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich. He has sent empty away. He has hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to the fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Notice her praise, first of all, is to God, her Savior. There are denominations that teach praying to Mary. Mary is this super being. You know, Jesus doesn't have time to hear us, but if you talk to Mary, he won't deny his mother. He's too busy for everything else, but if you go to his mother, you pray to his mother, she has power, she has authority over Jesus. Nope. Mary was and is a human, just a human, and a human that recognized she needed salvation and that the child she was carrying was the Savior of the world including her. And she praises him as such, my God, my Savior. And then she noticed his, her recognition of his power, his mercy, and his faithfulness. He does great things. He, he calls things that, are, that aren't as though they are. He, he does all sorts of great things. He does all sorts of things that nobody but God could do. And he shows mercy. He says, I'm, I'm just a lowly handmaid. And he showed mercy to me and grace. And then he's called me to this great thing. And he's, and he's faithful. He's kept his promise. He's keeping the promise to Abraham. She understood that the Messiah is the promised seed of Abraham. She acknowledges the prophecy. She acknowledges and confirms everything here because he's a faithful follower of God. And because she was faithful, God could use her in this most tremendous and fantastic event that is about to take place. But then there's Joseph. You know, if you were Joseph and your wife comes home and says, hey, baby, I'm pregnant by God. I'm going to have the Messiah. He told me. Okay. Um, can you show me your, your wine skins? Are they empty now? Can I, can I see those, please? I, when you, let me smell your breath. You want to believe your soon-to-be wife, but at the same time, she's pregnant. And again, they understood how this took place. But God, in his love, does not leave anything undone. He doesn't leave any doubt. He doesn't leave you hanging. He sends Gabriel again. you got to go to Matthew to get this, this part of it. So Matthew 1, verse 18, says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So she said, I'm pregnant. This is the thing of God. 
he's not really open to that idea because he knows how this works. But an angel comes and talks to him. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That is from Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. God didn't leave anything to chance. He didn't leave Joseph out there swinging in the wind, hoping he'd figure this, that he would believe his wife. This all starts coming around. Joseph gets the message, and God sends an angel. Joseph, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is okay. Your wife is highly favored before God, and your wife is carrying the anointed one. This is Emmanuel, God with us. She is carrying and going to give birth to God, the Son. How awesome is that? You think maybe Joseph had a little of that, Lord, I believe, help out my unbelief <laughs> going on in there. But the Bible says he, he followed God's direction. He did not know his wife until after the baby was born. God made some cool announcements. It's been silent from heaven. No prophet, no revelation, and all of a sudden, it's everywhere. Do you think there wasn't any talk in the town? Do you think talk in Jerusalem didn't make it down into Nazareth and all the surrounding areas when the priest came out to offer the blessing and he couldn't speak because he saw an angel in the temple? Do you think that didn't make the rounds through all the towns? People were in and out of Jerusalem for all sorts of things. That, that was a center place. That was the, the capital. That was where you had to go for the different feasts. People were in and out of there. And, and how good are people at spreading news? Even when it's maybe news that shouldn't be spread. We, we can spread it, can't we? You think just because they didn't have phones and newspapers back in, that word didn't get around? People were sending letters, like, you know, overnight mule. Uh, you know, however they were, just, they were telling. So it, it, was, it was being noised abroad. And then Mary has to come back and tell Joseph what's going on. And so she shares with him, and an angel has to come get him square. This is not, this is not just a, a well, the angel came to Zechariah, nobody will ever know. The whole town was out because he was supposed to pronounce the blessing. And they got to witness all of them, and he shared what the, what the angel had told him. And then Mary turns up, I mean, that Martha, uh, Martha, Mary, Martha, whatever Elizabeth's name is, she shows up pregnant. So you got confirmation in the town that what Zechariah said is true because now the old woman is walking around pregnant. Hello? When old women are walking around pregnant, something was different in nature. This wasn't a silent time. This just keeps building and building and building and building. And by the time we get to the birth of Christ, oh my goodness, it's a chorus of praise and shouting. We are about to have some experiences like this. We're about to see some things happen in our world as Scripture, the prophecies are being unfolded before our very eyes that are coming to pass before our very eyes. We're about to hear and see things that we've only read about. We're about to hear statements come from world leaders. We're about to hear all sorts of things happen. You need to go back and read Daniel. Go back and read Revelation again. Go back and look at some of these prophecies because this stuff is happening now. It is all unfolding just like the Bible said. What is the timeline? I have no idea. I don't know if it's immediate in the next few days, the next few months, by the end of next year or in the next couple of years, but the stage is being set. Everything is set up. We have the Temple Mount. They have a portable uh, a portable uh, altar that they can that they can lift without touching it with anything unclean, and set it on the Temple Mount to do the to do the sacrifices at the Passover. 
three years, 2019, I think it was, was the first time since AD 70 that Israel slaughtered a lamb for the annual sacrifice. First time since AD 70 in Jerusalem, the priest slaughtered a lamb for the sacrifice. Tell me it ain't happening fast. How many years have we said, man, I don't know how it can happen. We don't even know. You know everybody thought that the Dome of the Rock was the place. That's where the temple was supposed to be. That's not where the temple was. It was just down from that little ways. So we didn't know where it was. Well, you know, the end times can't happen because they've got to be able to rebuild the temple. We don't know where the temple mount was. Nobody knows where the Ark of the Covenant and all that stuff is. Yeah, they do. They've always known. Israel's always had control. And now we realize we have the, we have the temple mount. It's cleared. 2020, they were supposed to offer the lamb on the temple mount, and COVID hit, and they, they wouldn't let them do it publicly. Now there's the battle. They want to bring it out and do this stuff, and, and we're going to see it again about March, April. We're going to be back to this time again, and the Arabs are going to go nuts because they're trying to offer sacrifice to God on the Temple Mount just below the Dome of the Rock, and it just creates a whole nightmare. Folks, when we found the Temple Mount, that's when we had the thing in, in, in the uh, United Nations to say, to disavow that Israel had any historic ties to Jerusalem. You see, we're watching it. But we're not hearing a prophet. We're not hearing a new prophet. We're not hearing a new messenger. We're hearing the Lord through his word, through his prophecy. We're hearing it very loudly now. Very loud. It's here. It's about to happen. God doesn't get it wrong. He doesn't make mistakes. He gave prophecies about how Jesus would come and he came. He gave all these details. He sent, um, he sent angels to announce specific things. And it happened exactly like he said they would happen. And what we're about to witness is going to happen exactly like God said it was going to happen. Folks, we are living in exciting times, just as they were living in exciting times, because now the trumpets are sounding about the coming of Christ. The Messiah is actually here. He's being carried around in the womb of a young virgin woman. He's about to make his appearance on the earth, and everybody's hearing that, and they're getting excited. Those that will follow Scripture, those that believe God, who are looking for the redemption of Israel, they are hearing this, and they're getting excited. Simeon is praying, God, don't let me die until I see the salvation of Israel. And he's about to. All this stuff is happening. We're here. Ours is not about the birth of Christ. Ours is about the return of Christ. It is coming shortly. From here to the rapture, I don't know the time frame, but from the rapture to the end, it's 1,007 years. We know the exact number of days. We know that we're 1,007 years from this all being done and that's standing on a new heaven and a new earth and a new creation that God is going to make right in front of us while we stand in nothingness, while he burns it up and makes a brand new one. Just one last little show of his magnificent power and authority over everything. And we're going to see it. Right now we're so focused on the birth of Christ because it's Christmas time. That's what we're supposed to do. But I'm telling you, we need to remember it and praise God for it because it's the greatest gift ever given to man. God giving his own son as our sacrifice. But there's more excitement that we can have right now. Jesus was already born. He's already died, been buried and rose again. He's about to return. We're going to see him in all of his glory. The church is about to go home. We're going to see him as he is. We're going to be made like him. We're about to enjoy a transition of life like we have never been able to comprehend. We're going to be changed into the likeness of Christ in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the shout and the trump of God, and we're gone, and we're in new bodies, standing in the presence of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, and able to see them in their full glory because we are now made sin-free. It's about to happen. We ought to be excited. We ought to be telling people, it's Christmas, it's about the birth of Christ. Oh, but it's so much more. The birth of Christ was just the beginning of the end. Christ's birth, or his sacrifice, his resurrection, starts the end times. Do you realize that? When John wrote his first epistle, his, his, uh, his first small epistle, not the gospel, but the epistle, when he wrote that, he said, brethren, now... 
now are we in the end time. I believe it's the resurrection of Christ that begin the end. It's the rejection of Israel, the nation of their Messiah, God turning to the, to the Gentile world in the church age. It began the end. How long is this? I don't know. It's been a couple of thousand years already. How much longer? I have no idea. But we're there. We've been in the end time. This is why Paul thought it was going to happen. This is why when he told the Thessalonians, I don't want you to think things stay strange. So those of us who are alive and remain will not keep those who have gone on from coming up. When the trumpet sounds, we're going up, but we're not going to go before those. They're going first. And then we which are alive and remain, we which are alive and remain, he thought it was going to happen any day. For us, it really is any day. We are there. We ought to be excited, but it, we also should be busy in telling people, listen, if you're enjoying Christmas, understand this is just about the birth of Christ, the giving of him, his sacrifice is why he was here, and he's about to return. And if you're not ready, if you're not ready, if you haven't accepted Christ, what you're about to experience is far more than what our minds can truly comprehend. The judgment that God poured out on this world is going to be so far beyond anything. There's not a horror movie ever made that will compare to what God is about to do. Please let me show you how you can know you are saved. Let me show you in God's word how you can know you are going to heaven. This should excite us and motivate us and it should take all the fear of all the garbage that's going on. No matter what happens, we're near the end. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care the things that happen. I don't care the wars or whatever happens in the U.S. It doesn't matter. God's on his throne. Jesus is about to come back and this is just all part of it. It's a time to be excited because we're going to see it. I think we are going to see it. I'm excited. What about you? Are you excited enough to tell people about it? Are you telling people, listen, I don't know about you, but I've trusted Christ. I'm getting ready to get out of here, and I'm excited about it. I'm ready for this to be over. I, I'm, I, I would prefer it come before the election. That would just make my life really happy. Wouldn't have to read news. Wouldn't have to hear all the garbage. I'm ready to go. We need to be telling people. We need to be excited. We need to be excited as we celebrate Christmas because this is all because God sent his son to die for us. He plotted all this before he said, let there be earth, let there be heaven, let there be a universe. Before he said those first words, he already put this all in play. The creation was just the start. All this was already determined. Christ was already the sacrifice before the foundation of the world was laid. This is our great God. This is our God who's in charge. And this is our God who's about to turn to his son and say, son, go get your bride. Are you ready? If not, Jesus, save me, I'm a sinner. It's not even the words. It's the heart's desire to choose to trust Christ, to believe him so much that you want to put your trust for your eternity, trust for his forgiveness in him. If you do that, that's salvation. That's the assurance of heaven. And children of God, we need to be excited. God said he came to give us joy. He came to give us life and that more abundantly. We should be joyful. The world should see that in the midst of all the turmoil we're looking at, Christians are smiling and they're happy. And now we're even more excited because we see the day of the return of God, the return of the Lord, so present and so real. We need to be telling them, Father, you know our hearts and whatever we need to be and what we need to do. Father, whether we just need to be encouraged this morning and just reminded of how exciting it is the times that we live in, how we're watching your scripture just unfold before our eyes. Or we need to trust you as our Savior. Or we need to be more diligent about trying to share the gospel with others around us or to encourage other Christians. Hey, get serious. You don't want to be found just putzing along. Get up. Get going for Christ so he found, finds you faithful. Father, we're getting so close. We're so close. And we, and we seem to be so just complacent. Father, help us to get out of that. Help us to not be lukewarm, but to be on fire for you. Father, help us to be the people that reach out and tell others about you. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we ask you to move in our hearts and give us the courage to stand and move out whatever we need to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.